your Bibles this morning, I'm going to John the uh, 13th chapter, and uh, we're going to read several verses actually. Uh, we're uh, we'll be looking uh, from the uh, uh, first uh, 17 verses actually in the chapter, and uh, you want to read along with us. The Bible says in John uh, chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he had poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know after. Hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said he, ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Pray. Father, as we come to you once again, we recognize in ourselves no great ability or strength of knowledge, but only in you. For it is your word that tells us that the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, teaching us and showing us what your word says and what it's about. That we may grow thereby, that we may be disciples, that we may be learners, that we may receive from you those things that are beneficial to us, that we may be beneficial to others, that we may share the message that others may come to know who Jesus is. And Lord, as I stand here today, I ask for your touch and your strength and your anointing and Lord, that the word that goes forth would be your words, lifting up and glorifying our Savior, our Lord, our Master, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you touch here today, and if there is a need in this place, that you would meet that need, that you would meet the needs of any who may hear this message in whatever what manner it may be. In Jesus' name. He has raised the dead. He has opened blinded eyes. He has 
set the captive free in so many different ways. And all of those things are a part of who he is as the Messiah. Now we have come to the last few chapters in the book of John and the situation has changed completely because up to this point in the last chapter he was showing the people who he was. He was declaring himself in a manner that they could understand, receive, or accept, or reject who it is that he is. Now, in the last chapter, it talked about uh, they, how they have rejected him, how they had turned away from him. And we remember a scripture way back at the very beginning of the book of John where it says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not but to as many as received him, to them gave him power to become the sons of God. To those persons who would receive, he made them a part of the family. Those who would trust, those who would, believe, who would believe, would be a part of the family of God, adopted into the family of God, children of God. And these are the ones that as we begin this chapter that Jesus is talking about his own that he's talking about. Those that are trusted, he's talking about. And he begins to do uh, to talk to them about some very significant things in this place. Now we don't have in this particular chapter and in and in the book of John all uh, a lot of the things that we have in some of the other books as they say, show the fullness of everything about um, uh, the Passover feast and the institution of the Lord's Supper and everything that is a part of that. But John gives us a viewpoint of some things that we don't really see in the others. And he brings us a, an understanding of some things that Jesus was doing in this situation. What we, where we are, this occasion, is the Passover feast that after which they lead together. After they sing that song and they go over across the, the the brook Kedron, and they go up into the Garden of Gethsemane, and there Jesus prays, and they fall asleep as they should be guarding, and all those things, and in the process of it, then here comes the crowd that takes Jesus captive, and takes him down uh, to uh, the high priest's house, and where they have that mock trial, and all the things that are a part of that. This is the occasion we're on, and so it is very significant, Jesus knowing, now see what it says about this, you know, Jesus knew that his time was now. Jesus knew all about these disciples and about their, about what their thoughts were and their situation was and everything that was about to take place. He knew that he was about to go to the cross and be the sacrifice for your and my sins. And so, Knowing those things, he loved them and he gave them uh, some very significant instruction and thoughts during the course of this particular night. See, these chapters that we're looking at in chapter 13 and, and, and 14, as we go through these things, these are things that are happening at this supper. These are things that are happening during the time that they are together before he goes to that Garden of Gethsemane and uh, before this. And so, it is so important to hear and to look at and to think about the things that Jesus is saying in this circumstance. Now, when we look at this, uh, we look at what it says about them. You see, he he loved them. He loved their he loved these these people. These were uh, these disciples had followed him throughout the three years of his ministry. They had been with him in every kind of situation. They had seen him walk on the water. They had seen as he stilled the storm. The storm. They, uh, they were there when he cast out devils. They were, uh, they were there when he healed the eyes. They were there in all of these situations. And, uh, but they were uh, not who perhaps many of us would have thought about him calling. They were, they were uh, fishermen and they were uh, tax collectors, and there was at least one of them that was a zealot in one sense of the word that he desired to see the freedom of Israel. And there were, and there were all of those that uh, that he had with him, and he loved them, and he and he saw them as they really were. He knew 
uh, and tells Peter that he's going to deny him as, as we go on through these things. He he knew as he as he talks to all of these about what he's what's going on, what was in their thoughts and in their minds. And and we know from the other gospels that the thing that was going on as they come to this particular meeting, you know, where they come together, they're not seeing the cross. They're not seeing uh, what's about to take place. They're uh, in, they're oblivious to it. They're, uh, they, they, uh, their minds are, are totally on something else different than that. And so they began to discuss amongst themselves who's going to be the greatest and who's going to do this and who's going to do that. But Jesus loves them anyway. He loves, uh, he loves these, uh, these men that have been following Him. And so in the midst of all that they are doing and thinking, Jesus gets up from the table and finished the main part of the supper. Now there's other things that are going to be taking place as he sits back down with them, as he finishes up with this particular thing, as they go through the rest of the events that are a part of what Passover represented to the Israelites and what it was all about as they go through the details and everything else about, about uh, uh, what took place in Egypt and everything as God led them out by a mighty hand and all those things that occurred. But Jesus wants them to understand something. You see, you know, we, we have lots of people that call themselves public servants. And oftentimes, as public servants they're, they're, when they serve the most is themselves. We know that. You know, that often the situation and often the circumstances and I'm not mentioning or talking about anybody in particular but I'm saying that, that the way we tend to look at things is uh, the greatest is the one who is out there in front who's doing all of those particular things and Jesus wants them to understand that that's not the way things work when we think about eternity. That's not the way things are when we look at everything. It's not always uh, the one that's out in front in the circumstances, and it certainly isn't. Uh, and so uh, he got up to show them something very, very significant about who we are to be as Christians and what our attitudes ought to be and what our circumstances ought to be. And so as he looks at them, he gets up to serve and uh, he knows the attitude that they have. He knows what they're looking at. He knows that they're seeing him setting up a kingdom and them sitting on his right and his left and doing all kinds of things. And, and the reality is that Jesus tells us that there will become a day when we who have trusted him are kings and priests and we do the things that he wants us to do in his kingdom. And, that, and that's a good thing and a wonderful thing. But at right now, who we are is to be servants to one another, is to serve one another, is to love one another, is to see one another with the light that we want to lift up our brother and our sister, and we want to give them help and strength with, uh, as God gives us help and strength and to teach and all those particular things. And knowing that attitude with them as he went around, he girded himself with a towel he filled a basin up with water. He went over and kneeled down in front of each one of the disciples and washed their feet. Now, interesting, you know, thing about those kinds of things. I remember when I was a kid, I was in a service where we actually decided we was going to do some of this. And uh, I remember Brother Whitaker was the one that was in front of me. I would wash his feet, and when I went over and I sat down in front of him and he was, and we started to wash his feet and he reached down and started washing them too with his hand. And I, I just stopped and he said, no, you have to help do that. I was just a kid. I was trying to learn a couple of things, I guess, you know, about those kinds of things. But as he came to Peter in this situation, uh, Peter made a statement. He said, you ain't washing my feet. Now, he saw Jesus as who he was. He knew he was the Christ. He was the one that made that famous statement that we see in that other place where he says, 
But who do you say that I am? He said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. He said, flesh and blood haven't revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven, the Spirit has revealed this to you. Now Peter says this, and Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you've got no place with me. Well, now the truth of the matter is that when we look at that, if we are not washed by the by our Savior, we're not clean. If we, if His blood hasn't made us pure, then we're not pure. If we haven't been forgiven of our sins, then we still stand in our sins. If we haven't uh, trusted Jesus as our Savior, He hasn't made us clean. We need Him to make us clean. It is by we are washed in the blood, and sometimes we don't sing those songs anymore, but we ought to be said singing and saying them and talking about them because the reality is it is because we are washed in the blood that we are made clean and that we have a future in heaven. But he spoke to him and he told him, he says, he said, if I wash thee not, well, if he doesn't wash his clean, we're not clean because there's no other way to be clean because there is no other way of salvation. But then he says to him, he says, well, not just my feet, wash my head and my hands. I mean, give me a bath. <laughs> Basically, he says. Now, you know, the way they did things back then, it's interesting, you know, to consider. Now, you know, when I was a kid, uh, about sometime along the April or somewhere along in there, my mother would say, go on out and run around barefoot. You know, get out there and play and stuff like that. I, I never did really enjoy that a whole lot because uh, in the area where we lived, there was a, a lot of little clover, you know, and there's a lot of honeybees. And, and in spite of yourself, you'd step on one of them that had a honeybee on it, and next thing you know, you're scratching your foot because it, it was itching like everything. Uh, you know, we... Uh, I wasn't crazy about that. My brothers love going barefooted. I've always liked, I, I like having shoes on. And I want shoes that cover my whole foot, you know. Their situation was a little different. They had, they wore sandals. And so they get up in the morning and they wash, and they wash their head and their hands and all of their body, whatever, kind of the pool, do whatever it is that they did to make themselves clean at that particular time. But then they get out and they walk. And they didn't have blacktop. And it wasn't a concrete sidewalk. And they walked on a dusty road and their feet got dirty. And when they came into anyone's house, they would have a basin there that, and particularly if it was a, a significant guest, they would wash their feet in that basin. And they would, then they would come in house, whatever situation it might be like that. But Jesus was telling him, he said, no, he said, you're, you're, you're already clean. It's just your feet. Now, what did he mean by that? Goodness, what are we talking about when we start talking about taking a bath or washing your feet or becoming clean? Well, what he's saying to us is, he said to them, talk to them. He said, he said you're, you're clean. You just need a foot wash. Now, what he's saying is you've been forgiven of all your sins. But when you get out there living, doing whatever it is you do, you come in contact with the world, you face temptations, and sometimes you get a little dirt on you. Sometimes we do wrong. Sometimes we make a misstep. Sometimes we do something that we shouldn't have done. We're already a Christian. We're saved. He has washed us clean in every sense. But we need to, when we do anything wrong, we need to talk to God about it. We need to ask forgiveness. We need to get our feet washed. Okay? We're saved. 
But we need to have that fellowship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ that we can have with those things between us and Him. And so He says that. And then when He gets up and He comes back and He's washed all of them and recognizes who and all He's washed. Okay? We know all about Peter, James, and John. And, and we know Bartholomew and Andrew and we know all of them. We also know about Judas, don't we? Judas was the one that betrayed him. Judas was sitting there too. When Jesus walked around, he even washed Judas' feet. He was giving him that one last opportunity and finally he tells him, whatever you're doing, you do it quickly and all of those things. And then he went out from there. But Jesus loved every one of them. He loved Judas too. He desired Judas to be saved too. There isn't any desire for anyone to perish with Jesus. The reality is that as he went through the process of these things, Judas' heart became harder and harder until he was ready and willing and already made the decision that he was going to betray Jesus to those that were in authority. So he asked him, he said, you know what this is all about? You know what I'm doing? You know why I did this? Now, I want you to know this isn't about a foot washing service like we had when I was a kid. That's not what this is. It's not about that. It's about something far more significant than that because as Peter writes years and years into the future and what we just recently studied and looking into First Peter in our Sunday school class. He was, he, as he as he spoke about these particular things, and he he talked about uh, this example that we have. He was showing us what we needed to do, being served and serving others, and all of those things that were a part of that. You see, Jesus is the greatest example of all. The Lord of all, the Creator, the lover of our soul, who came to serve, who came to give, who came to do all of those particular things. And it is His example that we must follow. Now, there's nothing wrong with washing somebody's feet. Don't get me wrong. Vicki's aunt had a real good situation once where they were teaching about this particular thing, and she had Vicki's sister to dress all up in a strange outfit where nobody knew her and blacked out her teeth and one thing or another and she came in with, uh, with but she had went out and got in the mud and moved her feet around into it real good and she came in and they gave her some water and it's, it was a women's meeting you know and, and they had, and said something to her about washing feet oh I love that and went on through that and then when she left somebody said something about Oh, let's go wash your hands and all that kind of thing. Was, you know, we don't know where she came from. And Angie said, don't you know who that was? And, and she made me realize who it was that they had just, had just come in. It was an example. It was a picture. It was something to see what it meant when we talk about these things. The big thing that we're looking at is he was trying to teach his disciples it's not about who's the greatest among you, because the greatest is Jesus. Amen. It's not about which one of you stands the tallest in front of everybody else and tells everybody else what to do. So that's not what this is about. It's about serving one another. It's about loving one another. It's about caring about Christians. <coughs> By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And we're going to see that as he comes through this, as he finishes out the night before he goes out to pray. The big thing that we see in these verses, and probably one of the most significant verses of them all, he says, if I wash you not, you have no place with me. See, that's what's so important. 
He's not talking about washing with a pan of water. He's talking about washing our soul. He's talking about washing away our sins. He's talking about making us a part of his family. He's talking about trusting his sacrifice for us. He's talking about letting him be our Savior and coming to live within our hearts. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing God? Let me tell you something. You can come to church all your life. You can sit and listen to every sermon. You can turn on the Christian radio and listen to every song. You can listen to constant events on TV or wherever else you might see them. You can go to a Christian school and a Christian college and a seminary and graduate from every one of them and get them lost and go to hell. Because washing and cleansing are not automatic. Judas was with Jesus all the way through that three years. He heard every message. He saw all the miracles. He, he, was, he was with them when the storm stilled the sea. When the storm was stilled, he was, he, was, he was there with them on this night as Jesus took the towel and dirtied himself and washed his feet. He was there. And he heard the message. And he still rejected it still turned aside. And we know the fullness of what happened after he had betrayed our Lord and Savior and then went back and cast the money down in front of him and he went out and he hanged himself. Judas was with him, but he wasn't a part of him. He heard the same message everybody else heard. But he wasn't part of them. He didn't trust the message. He didn't believe it. If I wash you not, you have no part with me. If you don't trust Jesus as your Savior, you have no part. You need him. Whether you're sitting here or you're listening online or what you might be doing, you need Jesus as your Savior. And if he washes you not, you have no part with him. Now, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, the Bible says. Washed by the word, recognizing what the word says. Knowing that the word plainly says that if you don't believe that he's the one, you will die in your sins. That's what he said in the last chapter. Have you trusted him? Have you believed? Father, once again we come to you knowing that it is in Jesus and him alone that we receive salvation. We just pray, Lord, that even now, that wherever someone may be hearing these words, that they are in this service now, listening to YouTube or Facebook or wherever it might be, Lord, that you would touch their heart, draw them to you, and help them to recognize and realize that it is when we are washed in the blood of the Lamb that we become clean. When we trust Jesus as our own personal Savior, that things become right. And Lord, I pray that you touch that one, that they may believe, that they may confess, that they may trust in the work that Jesus did for them. Jesus' name. Amen. Number 122, let's stand and say the first verse.